Now, yesterday, we heard astonishing detail from the High Court, which found that the ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed Al Maktoum, abducted two of his daughters and subjected his estranged wife to a campaign of intimidation. A series of judgments were released after the court overruled the Sheikh's efforts to keep the findings secret. It also found he continues to maintain a regime whereby both of these two young women are deprived of their liberty. In a moment, we'll hear from Tina Yauhiayanen, who was kidnapped alongside one of those women, Princess Latifa. First, our security correspondent, Frank Gardner, is here. Extraordinary detail that has come through this, uh, these family court hearings, Frank. Um, what does it say about what's been going on behind closed doors? Well, most importantly, it stands up the allegations that have been circulating for quite some time. So it was actually fairly well reported by a number of media outlets that um, these two princesses had been abducted. But it's, this is the first time that the Britain's High Court has actually stood up these allegations and said, yes, they have foundation. In other words, they have found for the former wife, Princess Hire of Jordan, who has publicised these allegations, they found on her side. What does it say? Well, um, in the first case, Princess uh, or Sheikha Shamsa, she was abducted in broad daylight from Cambridge in 2000 after trying to escape from the family estate in Surrey. And she was, um, according to her account, uh, injected with a sedative. And then there's no question about this. She was put on a helicopter, flown to Deauville in northern France, then put on a, D a Dubai diplomatic plane and flown back to Dubai. And she's hardly been seen since. The second princess tried twice to escape. She was in prison for three years. She's given a very graphic testimony on video, which the court has stood up, uh, talking about her misuse, her torture, her being beaten up by the Sheikh's agents. And it's taken Princess Hire quite a while to believe that her husband could really have done all of this. When she found out, unfortunately for her, it coincided with him finding out that she was having an adulterous affair. So he was pretty angry. Um, she is the sixth of, and youngest of his various wives. Um, and she started to get intimidating threats. So she fled last year in April with her children to Britain. She's been sitting in court. I've been three feet away from her. This is a frightened woman. She is very frightened that the Sheikh, Sheikh Mohammed of Dubai, is going to try and abduct her children. He hasn't appeared in court. Um, the judge ruled that he had not been open and honest with the court in his account of what had happened to the two princesses, his two daughters by another marriage, who he has abducted. He went to great lengths to, to keep this secret, a fortune spent on lawyers. Yeah, he's uh, not poor. What is it, five, five million spent on, on lawyers? More? Oh, I see. No, 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 his no, no just, just the amount on, on the lawyers. Yeah. Um, now it's out there. Mm -hmm. what, what happens? Well, it certainly doesn't do Dubai's image any good, but it won't be reported in the Gulf at all. Um, there's hardly any reporting there. It's com state controlled media or state influenced media. No one is going to publicly talk about this in Dubai, that's for sure. There are questions to be asked, I think, of Britain's Foreign Office and um, how it didn't help the Cambridge Police investigation back in 2000. So there was a detective chief inspector who made an application to go to Dubai to visit and question Sheikha Shamsa about what had happened to her. And um, at the time, Britain's foreign secretary was Robin Cook. He got, quote, engaged in the story, after which no help was forthcoming. So in other words, the government at the time is accused of not actually, of essentially helping to muzzle this story uh, or the early part of it. Um, in the long term, I don't think it's going to make a lot of difference. You've been to Dubai. I used to live there. It's a global success, that place. And Sheikh Mohammed, for all his faults up there, is viewed in Dubai as the father of the nation. He's enormously popular. It's an incredibly successful business, holiday, vacationing, and technological entrepot. So although, yes, it does cast a bit of a bit of an unpleasant light on what's been going on there, after a while, it will be business as usual. And, and the statements that have come from him have basically been saying this is this is a private family matter, yeah. need to respect the privacy of the children. He's in complete denial about it. I mean, it's, he doesn't deny that uh, he brought these two women back to Dubai, but he says that, um, that essentially that they were, uh, they were being rescued, that they, one of them has psychological problems. 
complicating the matter is that when Sheikha Latifa uh, escaped from Dubai two years ago, she was helped by a former French spy who it appears was trying to extort money from her. Um, now, that doesn't change the fact that she was trying genuinely to escape from her family. And Tina Yohanan, who you're going to hear from shortly, uh, knows this story far better than I do. And she got to know the princess over a period of time. There is no question, the judge said, that she wanted to leave the family and she tried in a genuine bid to escape and she did not want to go back to Dubai to that family. What would you expect to happen now? Because um, these women have not been seen in public for a very long time. Latifa last seen December 2018. Would you expect there to be an attempt for there perhaps to be a bit more transparency for them to be seen? Um, yeah, I mean, human rights uh, organizations and there is a, a, this uh, campaign group called Free Latifa have been pushing for this some time. Mm. I think they're going to raise the matter with the UN. Um, the problem is that, you know, look, I've lived for years in the Middle East and in the Gulf, and when they want to pull down the shutters, they're pretty good at it. They just say, there's nothing to see here, go away. You know, we've got nothing to, you know, we, we respect human rights, we have we follow the rule of law, this is a private matter, there's nothing to see here, move along. That will be the official attitude. And I can't see Britain's government, which has very close relations with the UAE and with Dubai, it's a very popular place for British residents, a lot of people have got property there, there are close strategic defence, security and intelligence relations between Britain and the UAE government. I can't see Britain pushing loudly for this to be uh, exposed any further. Does he still travel here? He does, yeah, very much so. He comes to race meetings. Um, he didn't appear in court because he said as a head of, the, head of state it wouldn't be appropriate for him to do that. Uh, that wasn't viewed very well uh, by, the, by the judge and judges. Um, but he's been photographed with the Queen. It wasn't that long ago, only two years ago. They were both, him and Princess Haya, were photographed at a race meeting. Um, so will it change? I mean, he's a massive investor in horse racing and the whole global horse racing, the equestrian industry. Um, he's the founder and owner of Godolphin Stables, a hugely successful global brand. He owns property in, in Suffolk and in Surrey and in Scotland. He's worth billions. And this is what really frightens her, which is that here is a man with limitless, bottomless pockets that he can hire whoever he wants to do whatever he wants. And that's why she's exposed this story. And there is a paradox here, Joanna. If you look at both Sheikh Mohammed there and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, these are two people who the West or Western governments kind of fell in love with in the sense that they are, they are in, on paper, enlightened, open-minded, liberal, Western-thinking, um, progressive leaders and rulers who are trying to take their countries forward. And if you go to Dubai, it's an incredible place. Likewise, Saudi Arabia is advancing, but behind the walls, it's the same old patriarchal autocracy. Thank you, Frank. Well, as I mentioned, I've been speaking to David Hager, a human rights lawyer who runs the Free Latifa campaign, and also Tina Yahyainen, who is Princess Latifa's best friend, who tried to help her escape. She was also captured in the process and imprisoned. I asked her how she's feeling after yesterday's ruling, given that this is something she has been fighting for some time to prove. I'm very, very pleased with the news. I'm, I'm happy that the reporting restrictions were finally lifted and the whole world um, is, is, is now hearing the news that Sheikh Mohammed did indeed um, kidnap two of his daughters, Latifa and Shamsa. And this is now official and no longer an allegation. And of course, this is something that you saw up close yourself because you were on the boat with Latifa in 2018 when she tried to escape Dubai. You were there and exactly. she was taken back. What was that like? Um, obviously, that, that night when it all happened was, was terrifying. It's probably one of the, the, the scariest experiences I've ever had. Uh, the boat was stormed by um, Indian commandos who had machine guns. Um, they were threatening to shoot us. Um, it was extremely, extremely scary. And obviously, um, afterwards, Latifa was trapped away, uh, kicking and screaming. Her pleas for asylum were ignored. And then after that, um, myself and the rest of the crew were uh, kidnapped as well. And, and since then, the Sheikh has said that actually what happened there was that 
she was effectively being rescued and taken home. What did she say to you at that time when you were on the boat together, what, when she was taken? Um, what, was she, what, were her, what were her words about what was actually going on? No, she was actually repeating uh, that she's uh, seeking for political asylum and, and they were ignoring her. And obviously her, her last words were, you know, don't, don't, don't take me back, you know, rather shoot me here. She would rather have been shot there than go back? Yes. That must have been so distressing. Extremely, yes. And um, have you had any contact with her at all since she went back? Uh, no, no. The last time I've seen her was, was on the boat. And if you hadn't have been there and been able to leave and, and tell the story, do you think we'd even know what had happened? Um, probably not. I assume um, Dubai would have managed to cover this all up. They have tried very hard so far. Um, they've, they've issued uh, different kind of statements saying that um, Latifa is happy uh, with her family at home and yeah, they, they tried to cover it up. But it's no longer possible after this ruling has, you know, was made public. You've been a powerful witness. Have you ever been afraid for your own safety because of that? Um, no, no, no not, not really. I mean, I feel like after um, um, it all became public, um, you know, it, it gives me some form of protection. David, um, what happens now with this ruling? It's very powerful, but it's a civil court. It is. I think for, for, for us, it's, it's, it's a landmark ruling and there's, there's lots of um, avenues in which we can pursue with it. Now, one of the first ones that we've, we, we're already pursuing is that about three or four weeks ago, Tina and I were in the United Nations where we were attending the working group for enforcing voluntary disappearances. They've been investigating the disappearance of Latifa for nearly two years now. Um, now, that this will be very, very useful for them because this shows that the highest family court judge in, in England has made a decision that Latifa and her sister were kidnapped and were effectively enforcers appeared. So this will enable the UN to come to a conclusion on their investigation. So we sent the, the judgments to them yesterday. And that's obviously a very powerful conclusion if they can come to that. Now, of course, at the end of the day, he's a dictator in, in, in a country that is not a democracy. And so ultimately, only he can let Latifa go and only he can let Shamsa go. But we're looking to the international community and also to the authorities in the UK when we look at what happened with Shamsa and her kidnapping to actually take action now. And, and as you say, though, I mean, it comes down to whether he would agree to it or not. But there is now this huge amount of scrutiny and pressure. Um, what are your best hopes? I mean, our best hopes, uh, I think, as, as, as they always have been, is relying on um, diplomacy, relying on the media. Now, Dubai is a, is a, is a state that, rec that, that relies an awful lot on the British tourists, basically, and British pounds and, and the Western money. And it's unthinkable that a ruler of that country can do what he has now been found to have done in kidnapping his daughters, abusing his wives, breaking laws in England, and, and still we can have them as an ally. So we now need to look towards our, our government, to the Foreign Secretary, to the Home Secretary, to look at what they can do in, in, in terms of putting pressure on, on, the, um, on the UAE. And we can look to, to, as well as, like I said, the UN, and to every single person as an individual. Do they want to start considering boycotting brands owned by Dubai like Emirates until Latifa and her sister Shamsa are set free? Could he face criminal charges? I, th I think that's, that, that should certainly be looked at. Now, you, what, what you've got is a judgment that confirms that in 2000, he was involved in procuring the kidnap of Shamsa from the streets of the UK. That's a confirmed judgment now. It's a, in, in essentially a finding of fact in these judgments by the highest family court judge. And it also in, infers that there was some form of a cover-up of that by Robin Cook when in the Foreign Office. Now, that's very, very serious, and that needs investigations. Now, Tina and I last year were assisting the Cambridgeshire Police trying to reopen the investigations into the, the kidnap of Shamsa from, from the streets of Cambridge by using Latifa's evidence. Obviously, Tina has also seen, seen, seen Shamsa in Dubai. Um, 
So that's something that we're looking at. But and again, that's something that we will be now uh, addressing and, and sending these judgments. I'm, I'm sure they already have them, but we will be reaching out to the Cambridge police again. He has obviously, as we know, an estate in, in Surrey. It's, it's from that estate that Shamsa actually escaped in 2000, but was picked up very quickly and just a couple of months later in, in Cambridge. W would he still come here? I mean, do, w would he be able to without risking facing charges potentially? We're looking at that now with other NGOs and other human rights groups, because, you know, in terms of immigration, is he a fit and proper person to be coming to this country? Now, if, if, a, if an average individual had just been found by a, a leading judge in, in a court in England to have kidnapped two of his daughters and, and abused his wives and used intimidation and ignored laws, would he pass immigration laws to be allowed into the country? Highly unlikely. And therefore, if that's the case for a normal individual, why should we be allowing a ruler on those same basis to come to this country? Question, questions now need to be asked. Um, Tina, in December 2018, Latifa was actually seen in public. It was a, a meeting with Mary Robinson, the former UN Commissioner for Human Rights. It was a meeting actually arranged by Haya. Since then, she's not been seen. Yes. Do you have any idea as to, 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 to what you know, how she might be, where she might be, what, you know, how she is living, anything at all? I mean, obviously the judgment itself gives us clues that she's effectively um, held against her will. Um, I hope that she would have some access to the current news because that would give her some hope, you know, to, to keep fighting and not, not give up. And the two sisters, um, they are sisters from the same mother. The Sheikh has had several, several wives. Are the sisters close? Um, Shamsa? Yes. Shamsa, Shamsa was living in, in, in the same house and, and she used to be very close to Latifa. And Shamsa, you actually met her on a couple of occasions, didn't yes. you? Yes, yes. Did you know at that time that she was being held against her will effectively? No, I didn't know. I, I realised that she looked... Um, a bit shaken and unwell, and she was avoiding eye contact. Um, it was only after Latifa told me um, what had happened to Shamsa. And, and Haya, Princess Haya, it emerged in the, the, the hearings that have gone on in the family courts in this, case, in this country, because of course this is why this has all now come to the fore, because she came to this country to uh, seek divorce from the Sheikh and to, to maintain custody of, of the children. Uh, that she has with him in this country, uh, she said that for some time she actually believed the the line from Dubai that that it was about protecting the girls and that they they were there for their own protection. So the fact that you you had met Shamsa and didn't realise what was going on, how much of a change do you think it will be that now this is out there in such a way that it is clear that they're not they're they're not there. Of their own volition. Yeah, I believe there is um, no doubt anymore. Um, obviously, um, I assume that um, Haya hadn't met um, Shamsa and Latifa until um, after the kidnapping. I, I believe that only, you know, by visiting Latifa, uh, she found out the truth. You know, and, and after talking to her, this has been going on for you for for two years. Yes. Has this dominated your life since then, effectively, knowing what had happened there to your friend? It, it definitely has. But at the moment, I, I feel positive. I feel like this ruling is a step towards um, Latifa being free. And also, I hope that the ruling will help with um, United Nations uh, moving forward, putting more pressure on, on, on Dubai ruler to release his daughters. Will you stop fighting until she's free? Do you believe she will be free one day? I believe she will be free. And, and obviously myself and David have no plans of stopping the campaign until that happens. Thank you very much, Tina and David. Thank, Thank you. you. And that was Tina Yaoyanian, a friend of Princess Latifa. In a statement issued after the judgments were published, Sheikh Mohammed said, this case concerns highly personal and private matters relating to our children. The appeal was made to protect 
the best interests and welfare of the children. The outcome does not protect my children from media attention in the way that other children in family proceedings in the UK are protected. As a head of government, I was not able to participate in the court's fact-finding process. This has resulted in the release of a fact-finding judgment, which inevitably only tells one side of the story.